Welcome back to Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. Where we are now in control of the city of Dresden with a slight twist to things, uh, having the uh, Lich Banner instead of the actual Sword of Valor here. So I've been selling things. Uh, we uh, made more than a hundred thousand from that. And also I had a look through the weapons and um, as for Sila, Radiance is good. I mean, don't get me wrong, but the Zo Solemn Hour is uh, slightly better, to put it that way. Uh, we have a Bardish or a Glaive here that I'm wondering if... Have I given Sunfix any... Um... I'm not sure whether he's be he's supposed to be What did I pick on him? Beats. Right. And eventually he will be using a four shard. Well, for that, that means that the um the Soul Shear is uh, definitely a better weapon than the Decimation that he's currently wielding as a, as a melee weapon. And as for Camellia, you're using the Mind Piercer. I think that is better than the Tender Touch. Uh, that is a hard one, actually. She, she's not going to cast the Vampiric Touch spell, so I think that one is actually quite irrelevant. I think the best thing we can do with that is just to sell it, actually. I fully expect this episode to be uh, a point one episode, as um, we have many things we need to attend to in Dresden before we leave the, uh, the city. Let's have a look at uh, what Wilsar Garms has to say first and foremost. The bearded quartermaster gives you a friendly nod. What can I do for you? Are you going to manage the fortress now? <laughs> no way, commander. The quartermaster throws up his hands. Not in a million years. I can manage an expedition just fine, but running a fortress is a different kettle of fish. That's enough work to make a man's head explode, which is why they sent us an expert from Nerosian. Her name is Dorglinda Stranglehold. I've seen how she handles things. She knows what she's about, that one, I owe my day bless her. She'll be managing the fortress and I'll be take I'll keep taking care of the soldiers, just like I've been doing. So we have these two vendors. Uh, on the other side of the uh, stairways up to the uh, citadel, uh, we have two other vendors. We have the Arcane Weaver, who sells uh, Arcane Scrolls and also some basic uh, Arcane stuff, like Books of Resistances and uh, so forth. As far as I know, there is not really any of these cloaks that I or, or items that I feel that I want to spend money on. This, these would be good uh, on... Uh, Caledon with a plus five competence bonus to persuasion skill checks and also plus two enhancement bonus to charisma is nothing to uh, to uh, scoff of, but um, nah. Then you have the jewelry trader over here. Uh, she sells, probably to everyone's surprise, uh, various jewelry stuff. This one is also uh, a nice ring. Uh, they would not. Um, Stack, of course. Uh, but you can have, you can get some nice things here. This is one of the few uh, goggles or eyeglasses you can get in game. Too bad they're not really that good. It, I mean, plus one bonus to cast level checks made to overcome spell resistance isn't bad, but once per day you're allowed to take 20 on a dispel magic attempt. 
I suppose it could be good very late game for uh, Caledon when he gets his uh, Lich Dispel spell, because that one is uh, pretty devastating, but um, that is not in the here and now. I don't know if our companions have much to say to us currently. Oh, they do. Looking around the place, the Count seems quiet and dejected. Ah, Caledon. Hello there. I'm feeling uncharacteristically pensive right now. Or rather, I'm finding it rather difficult to put my thoughts into words today. I'm trying to understand something. We've been travelling together for, for a while now. What is your opinion of me? You don't let anyone get close. There might be a good reason for that, but you can always count on me if you ever need any kind of support. Darren's eyes widen in shock, and then he looks at you with bewilderment. Then he smiles. Have you any idea how terribly insipid you sound? Throw in some extra nonsense like, you can confide in me, and I'll be adamant that you were raised by a couple of trite playwrights who put you to sleep by reading their boring scribblings on the workings of the heart. Fine. Do you know why I asked you that? Because the answer to the question, what do you think about me, usually reveals more about the one doing the answering than the one doing the asking. Now that I've got you thinking, let's proceed to the usual small talk. You want to talk about your past? I've been thinking a lot about what happened since our visit to Heaven's Edge. Darren's face grows grim. I don't like discussing such unpleasant things. You seem to be quite capable of having fun, so why are you... I don't even know what you're trying to achieve here. I suppose you can always ask and I'll decide whether I want to answer or not. Tell me honestly, do you miss the people who died that day? Darren is silent for a moment. His pupils seem to pulsate to the rhythm of his thoughts, or emotions perhaps. I regret leaving my mother alone. She deserved a better death than that. They confined her to a room so that she wouldn't infect those who still believed they could avoid the illness and... Oh, I forgot that you didn't know. Alright, that's enough shakes his head. Let me be blunt. I don't care about my so-called kin at all. People die every day and none of those people were my friends. They're all dead, I am alive, and I'm able to enjoy life to the fullest. Besides, there are many things far worse than death. Were you ever, were you ever close to your mother? Hmm. Perhaps. Maybe. My mother loved me, and I loved her, even though I was a thorn in her side. How can you truly be close to your parents when you're just an arro arrogant whelp? At least I was lucky enough to have a real mother instead of a countess mother. Aristocratic parents often see their children as valuable investments and vessels for all their ambitions. Thank you for your answer. Can't you come up with something more exciting to ask me about? For example, why I hate equestrian statues, and what befell the marble horse of my marble grandmother. I should go. So I have uh, Melia over here. Yeah, I have nothing to talk to her about. Have these house ruins we can probably built back into a house now. It'll give us a book. Prodigal Sons. I mean it's perfectly normal that the uh, commander of crusade commander of the crusade runs around and uh, loots the homes of uh, his loyal crusader citizens. Know the way. Let's head on over to the head on over to the other side here. Uh, 
One thing I can do is this. Not sure if there's anything at all of interest over here. Yeah, door here seems to have been removed. Okay, so then... Can I talk to the skeletal marksman? No, he's, he's just hanging around. Okay, let's go down to the uh, lower city. We can do that here. We have Ember here. Nothing of interest uh, in regards to what she has to say. Here's the uh, theater. She does not have anything to say either. And we have the prison. Let's go say hi to Nura, shall we? I'm sure she will be thrilled to see us. Nura bears her teeth like a cornered rat. Come to gloat? I need information. Do you? And why should I give it to you? I have many ways to make you talk. Would you like to experience them for yourself, or just tell me everything? Nura sniffles angrily, staring at the floor. Finally, she mumbles, What do you want to know? Who did you work for? The Templars of the Ivory Labyrinth, cultists of Baphomet. Some serve him for rewards, others serve under dire threat. Some fools even think they'll earn transformation into demons. I only served because it was my chance at revenge. The Grand Master leads the Templars, and he is a mysterious figure said to be more of an ideologue than an actual commander. All the cultists I know answer to a woman named Jerribeth. I never saw her myself, but I heard that she is dazzlingly beautiful, and when she speaks, you believe, every, you believe her every word, even if you know that she's lying through her teeth. I have absolutely no idea where to look for her, but I know there's someone much more powerful and dangerous, someone the common followers never see. Rumor has it, it is Baphomet's flesh and blood daughter. Something like reverence seeps into Nura's voice. Minago also gave me orders, but I don't think I can tell you anything new about her. You've met, uh, you've met a few times already. Are there any other cultists in the Crusader army besides you? I think so, but everyone I knew about has been caught by the Eagle Watch. Herobeth sent a lot of us to the, to the gallows, but Baphomet will, will always find new ser servants. Always. Anyone could be a cultist, even Herobeth herself. You think you can tell your friend from your enemy? <laughs> think again. Who is the leader of Descari's cultists? Descari's cultists are dumb meat. They can't hide, only fight. But there are others among them, adepts of a higher rank, intelligent, dangerous wizards hiding somewhere in the world wound. They are led by Xanthir, the Plagued One. He... isn't human. I don't know what he is, but he's not human, that's for sure. They say he doesn't even have a human body, only a mass of insects swarming under his robe. Who was that huge demon that attacked us during the battle? That was a bailor named Darazand, the leader of those poor creatures who had been ordered to fill the ditches of Dresden with their own bodies and break the walls of the city with their own heads. He had them run drills every day, and every day they had to scrape someone off the ground. You're lucky that dwarf chased him off. Darazand alone could hold off a small army. He'll be back, and all of you here will be as good as dead. I have no more questions for now. Thought she would uh, say more than that. Just 
quick save. Okay, so specific there. As it should be. I thought she would be telling us. Oh, we need to talk to Anivia first. Of which I have absolutely no clue who where is. Ah, of course, she's in the uh, the citadel. So we need to go back to the dungeon because we need to talk to um, to Nura again. Uh, let's head on over to the One-Eyed Devil. Uh, this inn here, I've been inside there. That's where uh, Horgus, uh, no, not Horgus, Hyler. So you can respec your characters. He's he's inside that inn. We'll go in there as well. A short, chubby tiefling with a golden eye patch spits chewing tobacco between his feet and takes another pinch from a tobacco box adorned with jewels. A fine day to you, Commander. Welcome to the One-Eyed Devil's Trading House. His proud manner suggests that each word begins with a capital letter and perhaps even continues in capital letters as well. A trading house? It's just a shop. Ah, that depends. There was a time when I had nothing in my pockets but holes. But did I consider myself poor? No, I considered myself a rich man who was temporarily down on his luck. Optimism is important not only on the battlefield, Commander. You are the leader of a victorious army that will be chopping all the demons into mincemeat sooner or later. I am the owner of a trade empire, which, as you see, is only starting to grow. How did a tiefling end up on the side of the Crusaders? The answer is simple. The simplest thing there is. This is a good world, and I like living in it. Besides, it's the only one we've got. I'd love to know what's going on in the heads of the dimwits who are helping the demons destroy it. My best guess is that their horn grow inward, so there's no room for brains. I'm from Cheliax. Tieflings don't surprise anyone there, and they don't like demons any more than we do here. And why, sh why should they? The gods went to all the trouble of creating these this world. Even Lord Asmodeus and his devils helped with the construction. And now these freeloaders show up after all the hard work is done just to gorge and break things. It doesn't matter who you pray to. If you want to live, it's your duty to help. Isn't that a risky name for a store for crusaders? Ah, yes. A week doesn't go by without some dimwit boiling over. Well, they don't pay me to explain the difference between allies and enemies, devils and demons, Lord Asmodeus and all the riffraff like Baphomet and Ascari, so they can go hang. The tiefling spits between his feet and swiftly places another pinch of chewing tobacco in his mouth. Here's what I think. You like it, you buy it. If you don't like it, keep moving. If you're spoiling for a fight, take yourself off to the tavern. Why are your prices so high? We're saving the world from demons, and that includes you. That's some claim. Did you hear that, good people? First of all, my prices are perfectly fair, and they're no higher than you'd find anywhere else. Second, who's saving who here? Are you prepared to eat bark and fight with rocks and sticks? You know, I have open contacts with dozens of suppliers. I arrange deliveries and do whatever it takes to get you sharper weapons, better magical items, better food, and you're throwing the extra sp expense in my face? This is the thanks I get for honest work. What happened to your eye? Yeah. <laughs> Should I make up a story about a heroic fight with a horde of demons? Truth be told, this is how it happened. Back when I was a snot-nosed kid, I had just opened my first business selling pies on the street. The local lads quickly took notice of me and offered me protection in return for a small share of profits. The usual, you know. But I was so young and inexperienced and greedy, so I told them to bugger off. Well, they caught me and taught me a lesson. They took it too far, though, and I paid for the lesson with my eye, not just bumps and bruises. It's funny to remember it now, but back then, while it was happening, I was so scared. I thought they'd beat me to death. 
I remember I came running home in tears and my mum just started screaming. I didn't have a clue why and then I looked in the mirror and saw there were just shreds and mush where one of my eyes should be. I've remembered that lesson all of my life. Ever since that day when I start a business, I find some reliable business partners first. And if I had been born into a merchant family, my parents would have warned me about this and about plenty of other things too. But I was a poor lad, so I had to learn everything the hard way. It's a miracle how many times I escaped death by a hair's breadth. In fact, it's lucky all I lost was one eye. I can afford a new one, of course. But you know, I just can't find the time. It will cost a tidy sum, and I don't want to take it out of the uh, earnings. And besides, being the one-eyed devil is a big selling point for me. I'd get, a f I'd be a fool to get my eye back, only to have to keep it hidden under a patch. Have you heard about my new powers? What do you make of them? Your powers are nothing but misery and ruin. How does a merchant survive in an undead army? They don't need anything. But it's a good thing, I suppose. At least necromancers always need magic ingredients. I'll have to change my stock before your divine powers bring me to ruin. The tiefling winks at you with his only eye. What you've done is actually pretty brave dealing with the undead. Manny will object. But as long as you keep winning and pushing the demons back into the world wound, no one will rise to stop you. Officially. Unofficially, I'm sure they'll eat you alive the instant you let your guard down. At least you don't have to expect attacks from your own guard. You can't bribe a dead man. Show me your wares. That is a nice headband. Oh, a Haramaki. Doesn't really sell all that much, does he? No. Okay. Uh, I'll just take a quick break, so be right back. There we go. Let's head on into the inn. And there are, of course, things that we can loot here. And uh, as the dutiful commander I am, uh, this is uh, important. I don't think I will be able to pick that lock just yet. I have some trickery, but... Uh, wow, that is a very powerful lock. Perception 23, I don't think I will be able to manage. One old Kelly told this my brothers and me on his deathbed, and then he died. And no one knows but us. I know this is their sacred forest. They prayed in the meadow of the spirits. Shamanic rel relics, you say? A big treasure? It sounds like a lie. Everything was collected, carried away, and buried in that cave. The scouts say that a bear lives in those forests, a terrible one, and there must be magic guards in the cave. That's why we suggest you come with us. We'll split the treasure evenly. Okay. That seems to be what they have to say. Here is uh, Hylor. <clears throat> I think we've already. I'm sure, we've seen this. No, it was tell us again. No, this actually seems new. Tell us. Tell me how we almost caught the spinner of nightmares. Hylor's gaze grows heavy. It was six months ago. We got a lead where to look for her, a lonely inn along the road. We arrived disguised as travellers. I never took, out, took off that eye of truth for a moment. 
Tyler carefully takes out and wipes his magic monocle. We quickly identified her cronies, but the spinner of nightmares was nowhere to be found. I lost hope and gave the order to arrest the cultists. We managed it quickly and without any losses. The spinner of nightmares appeared on a stage where passing bards were performing. She sang a funny little children's song, and then the guests in the guests of the inn went mad. Their eyes turned bloodshot, and they attacked us in a rage. They grabbed whatever came to hand and tried to kill us. Stools, forks, their bare hands, and even their teeth. We were forced to defend ourselves. When it was over, we were covered in blood. Thirty-one butchered corpses lay at our feet. They wouldn't stop fighting even after their guts were dragging across the floor. The air reeked of blood, guts and shite. I was barely able to clamber out. My legs refused to walk across that slimy muck. Once I made it outside, there was only the night and the step. And her laughter. The delighted mocking laughter of a child who had pulled off a prank. It arched from horizon to horizon. As it echoed in my mind, I lost consciousness and fell to the ground. Tyler's story ends with a helpless sigh. The Pathfinder massages his eyes with his fingers as if trying to push away the horrific images he envisions. Tell me about your confrontation with the Spinner of Nightmares. Yeah, we've already had these. So I kind of feel that. Maybe something more like that. That is not far. So, the experiment. Neneo gestures excitedly. I will need some supplies for this one. Boy, please bring me a bottle of alcohol. And it will do. And please hurry up. Science can't wait. Why would you need alcohol? I've already told you. It's for an experiment. Hurry up and bring it to me. What kind of experiment? This will be an experiment of a uh, personal nature. Neneo seems sheepish. But no less exciting for that, mark my words. Why don't you go and buy a bottle yourself? I am busy with an extremely important task, mentally preparing myself for the experiment. Besides, a task like this is a perfect fit for my loyal follower. I'll come back when I have a bottle. I will await your return with the greatest anticipation, with immense, immeasurable impatience. Or we'll pick up some at the uh, tavern. There's four in autumn haze as well. There's a jewelry shop. And welcome to the shop of Darek Sunhammer, the finest jewelry in all of Mendev. True artistry. Crafted by the master himself and his apprentices. Take a look. No interest here. Not really. I don't think there's anything here. Except for the, the gold. I met other elves that looked just like Kailasa. A gloomy shadow crosses his face. He remains silent for a while, then says reluctantly, A few years ago, a sect of demon worshippers was uncovered in Kayonin. They were followers of Daskari, who had been brought together with by his priestess, Anamora. Naturally, as soon as the truth was revealed, a hunt for these evil zealots was called. They were all marked with the same brand of darkness as their leader, the wicked Kailessa. The sect was soon destroyed, but some of the cultists managed to escape. I pursued them in order to eradicate their evil, root and branch. <sighs> it is a great shame that the children of the noble nation have besmirched themselves with this taint, and I would be grateful if this confession were kept between us. 
animals are really making loud noises. Does that affect the animals? Yeah, that helped a bit. Okay. Let's pop on into the uh, half measure tavern. Which reminds me, we need to level up our uh, our real, yeah, our usually. She's going to be a pure level twenty ranger espionage expert. We will go with most of her skills, but instead of persuasion, we will pop into use magic device. As for her level ninth feat, we are actually going to take a weapon focused longbow, and then her mythic levels. Level 1, we will take Cleaving Shot. Level 2, we will take Deadly Aim, Mythic. And level 3, we will take Distracting Shots. Now let's have a look around here. I'll go ahead. There's Greybor. We can go back and talk to him afterwards. And then we have Fi, the tavern keeper. And we have a kitchen to loot. Maybe if we're lucky, we'll find some bottles of alcohol and we won't need to buy any. And there we go. Well, that was a cooking ingredient, actually. Let's talk to Fi, the tavern keeper. The boy sitting on the counter looks around 18. He salutes you with dignity, though his eyes scarcely rise from the tavern's ledger. The knight commander at my establishment. What an honor. My name is Fi Kito. I am the owner of the half measure. How should I address you? I ask because some don't like undue familiarity, while others scoff at the tediousness of ceremony and titles. You can call me Armored Armadillo for all I care. By my title, Knight Commander or simply Commander. As you wish, Commander. So, what can I do for you? Wine? A meal? A heart-to-heart -heart talk? How is it that, the young, that such a young lad owns a tavern? Before the Siege of Dresden, the half-measure belonged to a distant relative. I won't bore you with the details of how his family died. Just three words, demon worshippers and sacrifice should be enough. Now that a city has been liberated, the authorities and Iomedes church will be returning what remains to the lawful heirs of the deceased. And they take these things seriously in Mendev. Fai suddenly slaps himself on the forehead. He started talking about the inn and I remembered. I wanted to thank you personally for defeating the demon in this very tavern when the city was liberated. Without you, who knows how many glasses he would have smashed before the Crusaders got to him. So please accept my thanks from the bottom of my heart. 15,000 gold coins? Okay. The Half Measure is a strange name for a tavern. Oh, that's a family story. It's not for the faint-hearted, but you're not one of those, are you? One day, before the ward stones were erected, a peasant family got lost on the way to the fair and ended up near the borders of the World Wound. They stumbled upon a bored demon who killed the father right away. He then asked the mother if she'd prefer him to take all her children or only half of them. The sobbing woman looked at her three darlings and said, Half. The demon promptly cut the arms and legs of all the three children and said, I guess that's even, and disappeared. People across Dresden heard this story and after the family found shelter at the local temple of Iomede, for many years, they saved up for a regeneration spell so the children could be made whole again. They eventually scraped together enough for just one scroll and decided to give the youngest child a second chance at life. He soon became the tavern's first owner and called it, called it the Half Measure in memory of his family and the terrible incident with the demon. He had a good life for a time, got himself married and always planned to help his brother and sister, though he never got a proper chance. When the demons had Dresden surrounded, the poor cripples tried to run for their lives, but they died on the spot. The brother and his wife died a little later at the hands of deserters. 
there were rumors that the same demon that butchered the family came to Dresden and made a den of the half-measure. If that's true, I guess he got what he deserved when you freed the city. And that's the story. Pai shrugs pensively. Why do you like sitting on the counter? Two reasons, Pai says seriously. Dresden isn't the biggest city, but it still has a few taverns and pubs. To compete with the others, I need people to remember my establishment and myself. That's the first reason. A tavern keeper who sits on the counter definitely sticks out from the others who prefer to stand behind their bars all dignified. Believe me, you're not the first one to ask. Sooner or later every customer does. The second reason is the place's atmosphere. People should feel relaxed here. Life near the world wound is hard enough, and folks don't go to taverns looking to cause each other more trouble. So I allow certain liberties, myself included. I'm even thinking of hosting an invigorating brawl here on the 5th of every month. I'll let my favorite customers break glasses and swing on the chandelier. What's the feeling here in the city? I can only tell you about my customers. They're mostly working folks, the ones who are rebuilding what's been destroyed, along with soldiers and some merchants. Overall, spirits are high, as high as they can be in Mendev, a nation of rattling sabers and fluttering banners. Everyone loves it when the demons get their horns, tails and other parts handed to them. They've already forgotten that we nearly lost Canar Canarbus. More is like that. People live for one day and that day is tomorrow, not yesterday. You've been a source of joy and inspiration for everyone as well. Just a simple guy. An ordinary human, not an elf with the wisdom of ages, not an Azimar blessed by heaven, and yet you defeated the demons and thumbed your nose at the Queen's Knights. That's the kind of story people love. This calls for toast, doesn't it? Indeed, drinks on the house. We get need. What do your customers say about my new powers? The lad shrugs. Uh, the kinds of things people say at a tavern. Some folks say you're just a dolled up corpse, bossing the other corpses around. Others say you've been sent here from Geb to build a kingdom of death. There's even a rumor that you're an immortal lich. But most folks say that Iomede blessed the Fifth Crusade and sent you her power. The demons have done such evil here that even the dead cannot rest in their graves. And the hour of reckoning is near and you are its weapon. That's what they say, and I can see what they mean. Let me see what you have on offer. Goals of Malocchio, those are those are very good. Yeah, we're going to buy those. Mulled wine. Yep. Thank you. Uh, those goggles we should put on uh, Lan, I think. Wherever they went. All the way down here. Getting plus 10 competence bonus on perception checks for Lan, who already has very high co uh, perception, is very nice in itself. But the additional effect that whenever a wearer of the goggles confirms a critical hit with any bow, the target becomes disoriented for 1d4 rounds, suffering a minus 4 circumstance penalty to initiative checks, attack rolls, athletic and perception checks. Yep, definitely. Uh, we also need to uh, scribe that recipe wherever it was. Am I blind? Did I scribe it? There it is. Okay, let's talk to Greybore. How can I help you? Tried to kill that huge demon at the Battle of Dresden, but you failed. What happened? Yes, that was a failure. It was supposed to be a clean job. An anonymous client, a worthy target, a substantial fee. But the client insisted that I use an enchanted dagger they provided. I was assured that a single hit would be enough to finish the job, but it didn't work as expected. It was a serious blow to my reputation. And my reputation is everything to me. Who are you? Don't you remember our last meeting? 
The name is Greybor. I'm an assassin for hire. But I suspect you're not here for small talk. Are you in need of my services? We will go back to him when we're ready to go for the uh, dragon. For now, I don't think we're ready to fight a dragon, so... Good luck. If you wish to make use of my services, I'll be here. But not for much longer. I am expecting new orders to arrive soon. Okay. We need to put him into the party to uh, go after the dragon, so... That should be most on this side of town. Uh, let's head on down. Wait, no, it isn't. There, there should be some buildings. Yeah. There's the prison. Okay, they, they are down there. Okay, let's uh, head on over here then. Takes a while to, uh, to run through the city. I know what to do. I know the way. Here's the barracks. So we have Sila here. Sila looks sad and pensive. Okay, that's going to be annoying. We just do that. It's good to see you. Get this, Janna, the one who ran away when we were attacked by demons, never went back to her unit. She was seen running toward Numeria. Looks like she deserted. Anyway, that's not what I wanted to talk about, or not the only thing. Since our raid on the Houndheart's camp, I've had this sinking feeling that I made a mistake. Dragging you into this, I mean. I should have known that a raid along the edge of the world wound wouldn't be so easy. But mostly... I was wrong about a lot of people. About Janna, who lost her nerve and abandoned her friends. About Curl, I knew he was a thief, but I really thought he'd turned over a new leaf and deserved a little compassion and trust. And Elan, I thought we were kindred spirits, friends through thick and thin. But it looks like I was wrong about him too. Sela looks at you closely, waiting for your answer. You've definitely made a lot of mistakes. You can't go on blind trust, especially when it comes to people who've slipped up in the past, like that thief Curl. But I made mistakes in the past too, and I managed to find my way toward the right path. Why should I deny others the same chance? Forgive me, I spoke out of turn. I will think about what you said. <sighs> Thank you for listening to my grumbling and for helping me to get to the bottom of this. I'm not going to leave things as they stand. If I get the chance, I'll track down Janna and see if I can talk some sense into her. And find out why Curl did what he did. I can't stop thinking about what Elan told me in the end. I really have become more powerful than paladins who are far more experienced and selfless than me. There's something not right about it. A servant of Iomede should gain their powers through dedicated personal effort. It's the only way to make sure they'll use the power for good journey so far, it's all wrong, and it means I need to be three times as hard on myself now. Uh, the fate of the League of the Cart affected you greatly. So you could say, I did what I thought was right. I tried to help a good person with their troubles. And what came of it? I'm sorry, but I won't find peace until I track down Curl and Janna. What were they thinking? Is there any way to get through to them? Or should I just admit that I was terribly wrong? There is another thing that's worrying me. The people, the way people react to your power and mine, they think that if we have been chosen by Iomide, they need to pray at our feet. I'm not comfortable with the younger warriors hanging on my every word. She smiles sourly. I feel alone. Nobody else is going to sit with me and celebrate saving a beer cart, and I'd like to regain, if not the friendship, at least the trust of the other knights. Especially those I respect and consider my friends, like Elan. See you! The 
there's anything we can do here other than that. Uh, it's basically going into the barracks. But I think this is a good place to uh, to wrap up this episode. Uh, probably the point two episode in regards to uh, Dresden and uh, all the things going on here and the conversations we need to hold. If you have any comments and or questions, then please do feel free to leave those in the comment section below. But for now, thank you all so much for joining me and I hope to see you all in the next episode.